Hey, welcome back, everybody. Once again, this is Mark Lawrence, and we're all set to go against the spread on this, the first week of the 2024 NFL football season, week number two in college football. And we've got a panel guest of experts to break all this down for you here on the show. And with that, I'm going to welcome in the experts, Victor King, the proprietor from the Totals Tip Sheet from Playbook. Victor, welcome to the show this week. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. And it is, as you mentioned, uh, the week for totals tip sheet number one. It's hot off the press. We put it out on uh, Monday, the holiday. We sent it out to all of our subscribers. There it is. It looks good when you print it. It looks really nice on your phone as well. And the colors really pop. We're looking forward to a great season with our totals tip sheet. And of course, we got a whole new revamped back page that's all Tuco, his team totals, first half totals. <laughs> charts and his selections as well and we are ready to go not only that mark but our playbook newsletter number three just came out about what 20 minutes ago yes. and we're looking forward to that publication as well as well victor uh good news and good news about the totals tip sheet i printed mine out in color not only is the color pop so do the winners out of that publication victor you do a terrific job with that Andy Isco from TheLogicalApproach.com from Las Vegas. Andy, how's everything going in Vegas for you? Everything the the is, is wonderful. Now, Victor, I've not read the, the totals tip sheet yet, but I'm guessing somewhere during the course of the show, you are going to have an amazing week one, uh, I'll call it trend or history regarding re week one totals. I, I checked the last three years, and it's pretty astounding. It is. It's underwhelming. Yes. <laughs> That's a hint if I've ever heard one. <laughs> Jim Feist from Las Vegas, the legend himself. Jim, how's everything going for you as we get ready for this 2024 well, anniversary? Well, it's pretty pretty exciting. You know, with football, football season everywhere in the world excited. Yesterday, Andy and I ran around. We joined a couple contests. Nice. We had a great lunch. We, got, we joined the Superbook contest at the Westgate. We joined the Circa. And I, I believe a couple other people on this phone call or video, whatever we're doing, is also, are also in the contest. Yeah, we we teamed together, uh, Andy, Jim, I, uh, a couple of friends. I'll give you guys a real quick little synopsis of a story. Uh, we were all sitting uh, at the Westgate Superbook just chatting for lunch. That lunch was a four-hour lunch, by the way. <laughs> and it got to be so long, we decided, uh, my wife Colleen was with us, and I promised her a banana split while we were in Vegas. So we ordered a banana split while we were there and that's the name of our team entry, Banana Splits. That's how it all with, came with, to be. With a Z. <laughs> with a Z, yes. And this year it's 2.0. You know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tony Mejia, contributor to the Sporting News and Playbook expert. I know you're ready for this football season as well. I am, and I'm glad that I got in uh, in this Wise Guys contest. I, I joined nice. something that Ellie is doing because I miss contests. I, I, I didn't do them uh, last year. Uh, and I did them, I didn't do them this year, the Circa or the Westgate, but I'll, I mean, I'll get back to it at some point. I just haven't gone back to Vegas and I could do it with the proxy, but I did in lots of limbo over here. So I'm glad I'm in at least a couple of contests. And then as far as work goes, just doing gold sheet write-ups uh, and uh, some sporting news stuff this morning for the uh, NFL stuff, little blurbs on uh, angles on props and, and whatnot. So yeah, man, this season is, ready and here and good to go uh, i mean we all know that it's it's a guessing game but it's an educated guessing game so it's what it is uh, educated for sure hope that everybody uh, has a great season for sure i never went to college i never got a diploma but i'm educated because we're in the world of sports <laughs> handicapping <laughs> greg de palma our extraordinary executive producer greg how's everything going for you this 2024 football season very good uh finished just about season preview interviews on the RLS Football Network, which has been very, very insightful. Really helps uh, when you're handicapping games to find out what's really going on with specific teams and, and, and you know, writers, uh, broadcasters that follow teams all season long. So, yeah, that's been very cool. And then last week, of course, uh, we had our first RLS show for the season. And I uh, just want to let everybody know that two of our uh, double-digit upsets uh, paid off. Uh, my Sam Houston beating Rice and Mark's Boston College over Florida State. So off to a really good start. Off to a real nice start. That's the Our Lads Network, and Greg and I do a podcast each week for Our Lads and a lot of great information, as Greg just mentioned there. 
Is, that, right, is, guys, that, is that O-U-R lads? Is, is O-U-R that lads, L-A-D-S. They're, they have as much good information on the National Football League that I've seen from anybody, especially when it comes to draft time, because they keep a pulse on every player in the world of college football as he prepares himself for the NFL and uh, all his career shortly thereafter. Ourlads.com, check it out. I, w- I definitely will, yes. Okay, guys, before we get into the games this week, uh, let's do a quick review of who each of our experts, who all of us like it to make it to the National Football League Championship game, our Super Bowl matchup this year, and our top three Super Bowl futures. Uh, with that, I'm going to start it all off with Andy Isco. Andy, how do you see this all shaking out this football season? Well, it's always easy to make a case for the defending champions or the defending participants in the previous season's championship games. So that would be Detroit, San Francisco in the NFC and Kansas City, Baltimore in the AFC. Now, I do have one of those teams making the championship game in the NFC, and I have Detroit, who almost knocked off San Francisco in what was really uh, you know, an initial playoff experience run for them. And uh, came really close, uh, but for a couple of decisions and things late in the game, Lions might have been playing in the Super Bowl. I think they, I think they will avenge the loss last year, because I have those two teams meeting again in the uh, NFC Championship game. In the uh, AFC, of course, it was Kansas City and Baltimore. Uh, this year, I'm going with, uh, I believe I have Cincinnati over Baltimore in the, uh, or maybe it's, I'm not sure if it's Cincinnati. You didn't even know your own pick, Andy. Well, I've only looked at it 20 minutes ago um, it, because my pick is Cincinnati to win the AFC. And uh, uh, I'm going with the uh, – and, of course, a lot of it occurs on the season-long health of Joe Burrow. So for that reason, if I'm going to be right with those two teams, I'm going to go with Detroit to win over the uh, the Bengals. My uh, analysis of those two teams says both of them are known for their potent offense. I mean, I'm assuming that the uh, Jamar Chase situation will be settled relatively early in the season. Uh, but they, I think they both have underrated defenses, and I think that that makes for a very compelling matchup. You can make a case for um, probably a dozen teams with re- legitimate, if not realistic, shots at making the Super Bowl, but I'm going with a little bit different this year, and I think that uh, the Bengals will end up denying Kansas City an opportunity to uh, win a third straight Super Bowl. So you have Cincinnati over Kansas City. You're right. And, and Detroit uh, over? Detroit over over San Francisco in a rematch. Okay. And then Detroit beating San Francisco. Uh, Victor King, how do you, Victor, how do you see the NFL football playoffs shaking out this year? Uh, a couple of small, little, subtle changes, but uh, much of what Andy just said, I'm uh, in total agreement with. Uh, in the AFC Championship, I do have the Chiefs beating the Bengals 27 to 24. Oh, wow, scores. In In the NFC Championship, I've got a rematch of Week 1. I've got Detroit playing the L.A. Rams for the Mm -hmm. NFC Championship, and I've got Detroit winning that game 31-24, to meaning I am in agreement with my colleague, Mr. Jim Feist, and I see Detroit playing the Kansas City Chiefs in the Super Bowl. I think Detroit wins. I've got the score 31-27, to but let me just see one thing about these Chiefs going for the three-peat. Now, we know they had a less-than-stellar year on offense last year. They only averaged 21.8 points per game on offense. They went under their team total in 14 out of 19 games, including the playoffs. Yes, a wonderful, absolutely one of the best defenses in the NFL. But this is a team that if they can improve on offense by – a manageable four to five points per game and get under that maybe 26 point per game, 27 point per game range, then yes, a three po- uh, a three-peat is definitely possible for the Kansas City Chiefs. All it's going to take is a little bit of improvement on offense and for that defense to still play gangbusters like they did last year for Kansas City. Victor King, his analysis of the upcoming National Football Leagues for the 2024 football season. Tony Mejia, how do you see the postseason breaking down in the NFL this year? Well, I know you guys uh, hate the 49ers because we've talked about this. I actually think I, I'm putting a, I'm putting a little basketball uh, rationale behind my football pick because I, I think it's the 
close call turns into driving force thing. That's already failed for the 49ers once, but I really do like that uh, things seem to be coming together. Uh, Brock Purdy, I'm, I'm a believer in him, but if they if they don't, uh, if something happens to Purdy, I actually like this Josh Dobbs signing, and uh, I think I, I think he could be a, a Cinderella story. But more than more than anything, you got Trent Williams back. Now you got Brandon Ayuk also agreeing to his deal, and uh, Christian McCaffrey good to go. So the 49ers to hit the ground running. They play the Jets obviously Monday night, uh, and I just think that they're by far to me the best team in the NFC. I, I, I see the AFC as a little more wide open, but uh, NFC-wise, I think the 49ers play in a division they should be able to navigate well and ultimately will end up in the Super Bowl. I'll take them over the Packers, but you can really bring up any, anybody else, um, you know, the uh, usual suspects that uh, should be uh, in the mix. Because uh, really, I, I think parity-wise, I, I like the AFC better. Depth-wise, I like the AFC a little better too. Uh, and so I will go with my surprise play out of the AFC. And I, I think they're plus 1,600 to win the Super Bowl. So if you want uh, to play that route instead of the plus 600 that the 49ers would bring you, I'd go with the Houston Texans. I think uh, they may be, and uh, obviously they have made the playoffs already, but they may be one of those cases where they don't know uh, that they're not supposed to do something this year. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and that might work out in their favor. Really love their secondary, I think Stingley is has been um, somebody that's lived up to billing. Love Jalen Petrie. Uh, that defensive line should be improved with Daniel Hunter coming in. So it, it, it's a it's a team that I believe in. Uh, I like the Bengals too. I like the Chiefs as well. I, I think as Mahomes, as long as Mahomes stays healthy, you know, to be the champ, you got to beat the champ. I think somebody ultimately does. Whether it's the Texans or the Texans get uh, you know to uh, benefit from somebody else finally getting past Kansas City. I think Houston has the best chance to be the uh, rep in, in as far as the number one seed in the AFC. And what's interesting to me is, will this team be battle tested? Their December features a home game against Miami, a trip to Arrowhead, and then a home game against Baltimore before they close out against Tennessee. So that, that'll that get them ready. Uh, and then if, you, if you're in the mix to be that number one seed in the AFC, you beat the Titans and you your bye week. So really like how things set up for them. Ultimately, San Francisco over Tennessee in the Super Bowl. Over San Houston? Francisco over Houston. Houston. Oh, pardon me, Houston. And Houston's case. beating uh, who? Kansas City? He, uh, San, San Francisco over Houston. No, no, no. Who's Houston beating? Oh, Tennessee, who, who does Tennessee beat? I'll say Cincinnati. Um, maybe since Burrow gets, gets past my home. All right. And then San Francisco over Houston? And the Super Bowl. And, and San Francisco over Green Bay in the NFC. Got it. Jim Feist, the man in the know in Las Vegas, having just oh, entered the major contest, the National Football League contest. Oh yeah, we got the we got the contest stuff here. We got it right here, the two contests. I'm wearing one. Got the other one. Can't wear both, so I have to wear one. <laughs> um, the um, it's going to be a fun year. I like the line. Oh, excuse me. By the way, Jim, I just realized what we can do. We can wear both T-shirts, uh, one rolled up, and you have the one on the front and one on the back. <laughs> yeah, like a walking sandwich board for the two properties. Well, I'll tell you what. When I was driving home yesterday, I got in the car. It was red hot. I mean, you're super hot yesterday here. I don't know how the hell it's still hot. But driving across the strip, I look at the thing, 114. Mm. I get up the road a little bit. High, it's 118. I said, oh, I mean, this was supposed to, like, start to cool off, right? Oh, my God. It's hot. It's still <laughs> hot. Jimmy, it's supposed to cool off. You live near the mountains. You're supposed to get cooler, not hotter. Well, when I get up here to the house, we got about a 10 degree drop because we're at like 3,300 feet at the house. So that's a, and a lot of people don't realize this, but I think the strip is about 1,200 feet. So it, that's a, a pretty big difference in temperature. So in the winter, we're, we're, you know, we get, sometimes we get snow. So it's, it's, it's a different world up here. But anyway, I like the Lions to get to the Super Bowl. I like the way they played last year. We also what they did. They could have won at the end. Uh, I'm not gonna knock the Niners at all. I mean, they have all the talent on paper, but you know, the, the, they, they just failed at the big game. And I think this is a time when we're gonna get a little bit of a change in the NFC. Everybody talks about Green Bay. And I think it's a short sample size on love from last year he didn't start out the year well but he sure ended up well and 
it, it, that's a hell of a division. Uh, the Lions just have to win that division, and they get in. You know, they're going to get in the playoffs. They'll meet the Niners in the in the championship game. Beat the Niners, go on to the Super Bowl. And I hate to be like a chalk eater here, but the Kansas City Chiefs really improved the wide receiver. And Victor said they only averaged 21 points a game last year. You know, when Mahomes a quarterback, and you're saying 21 points a game, that just doesn't that does doesn't ring true. True, that, you know, he's a guy that should be getting 27, 28 points a game with his talent. Then, but now they have some receivers. They got Rice. They got Worthy. Um, they give him protection on the offensive line. Right now, there's nobody as good as Mahomes in, in football. So, I look, um, and I just don't. I, I know everybody likes Cincinnati, and and there's good reason for that. However, it really bothers me the number of injuries that Burrow has suffered. And for him to get through a whole season without being injured again, that's probably a long shot. So, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go with. Um, with uh, can uh, with Kansas City to beat the Ravens again and get themselves into the Super Bowl. So you've got the there same go. championship game matchups as last yes. year. Yes. Except are you going to have Detroit beating San Francisco? Oh yeah, Detroit's going to get into the Super Bowl and play Kansas City. And who wins? I'm going to go with Handy Reid, Spagnola. I think that combination uh, head coach, defensive coordinator, Mahomes, the best quarterback, and and, and there's Andy on the on the cover. Um, it, it, n- it never been done before, but you know what? It, it's never. There's not that many teams that have won two in a row that got to the Super Bowl. So all you got to do is win one game. You don't have to win three. Just win one, and uh, I think it'll happen. I think Kansas City wins it again. And by the way, yeah, that would be an interesting matchup uh, with Kansas City going for a record third straight Super Bowl and Detroit appearing in its first ever Super Bowl. Yeah, coming off of uh, its first division win in 30 years last year on top of it. So, uh, but times are changing. There's no question about it. Greg DePalma, what's your take on this year's NFL football playoff situation? Well, uh, there's one team that I'm going to bring to the party that hasn't been brought yet. And you know who that is because... uh, We have J-E-T Jets. Yeah, no, that's not it. And uh, Mark knows because he's he's also brought this team to the party, and that's the Cleveland Browns. So, uh, and again, just like you said with Burrow, uh, nobody can predict injuries. So if Deshaun Watson's healthy, then I'm all on board, and I'm taking Cleveland. Actually, it's going to be something. It's going to be Mark's pick, too. Uh, We did this on uh, our lads uh, show the other day. Uh, Cleveland over Cincinnati in the AFC Championship, and Detroit over Green Bay in the NFC Championship, as I think both of those two teams came oh so close and probably should have beat San Francisco last year, but they just weren't ready. I think they'll be ready this year, so they'll face each other. Detroit beats Green Bay, and I have the Cleveland Browns beating the Detroit Lions in the Super Bowl, and uh, and again, what... Uh, what a what a ratings bonanza that'll be for the network <laughs> to have Cleveland <laughs> and Detroit in the Super Bowl. But the no fans more, will more. love it. Fans will love it because it's it's something different, something new. Uh, and uh, of course, Brown fans and Lion fans will probably go ecstatic if something like that happened. So, Mark, I don't, I haven't done a quick look up, but I, li- I like Greg's projection there. But maybe you know all, uh, quickly, has there ever been? A pair of championship games in the same season that match two division rivals. That's a great Any question, answer? Andy. I do not know the answer to that. We'll have to take some time and maybe share it with people next year. But uh, that's a great question. Uh, you, you usually don't, don't find it very hard to get two teams in the same division in, in the, the playoffs. In the playoffs, much less you know. the championship right. game. Did the but Giants beat any... the Washington Redskins back in the day when Parcells was coaching? Was that a championship game? Do you remember, or was that a a, a round before the Niners? That might have been a round before. The, I'll, I'll see if I can check on that. I do. I'm going to give you guys the answer in five minutes. That'll be my little project. And and, and I know uh, New England when they went to the Super Bowl, did they beat Miami in the championship game, or did they beat someone else in the championship game? I think it might have been Miami. But anyway, yeah, Tony will check it out for us. Okay, those are Greg De Palma's selections here. Uh, my choices, as Greg mentioned here, 
in the AFC Championship game. I've got the same thing Greg has, Cleveland against Cincinnati, the Browns and the Bengals, both from the Buckeye State of Ohio. NFC Championship game. I've got the Rams playing the Eagles. And in the Super Bowl, I would love to say I've got the Browns over the Rams, but I don't. I've got the Rams over the Browns. So if we get that far, Greg, uh, one of us will be right, one of us will be wrong, but everybody in Cleveland will be ecstatic. I can guarantee you that. Oh, yeah. And you'll be hoping I'm right. No question about it. Super (laughs) Super Bowl winner, I've got the Rams winning the Super Bowl this year. Uh, Earlier on in the show here, uh, Victor mentioned about the playbook issue number three is out right now. We just put it out just before we came on the air. And uh, if you haven't got it yet, and I encourage you to do so, it's available for download right now at playbooksports.com. Here's what you're going to find inside this week's issue of the Playbook Football Newsletter. We've got a college football team that's 12-0 and against the spread when they're a road dog with revenge, the role they'll be in this Saturday. We've got a college football road favorite who is 2-23 and against the spread when he's coming off a double digit win. And also, if you wondered how college football teams do in game two, that come off a loss if they were a bowl team the previous year, they don't do well. We call it bowler blues. And you can find out all about that in this week's Playbook Football Newsletter. On the NFL side of the things in the Playbook Football Newsletter, I'm gonna share with everybody, there's a quarterback that's 13 and one against a spread in his career when he's not favored, either a pick or a dog. He's in that role this week. We've also got a team favorite in game one that is three, 21, and one straight up in season openers, and they're favored. Uh, you'd like to know who that is, who all these teams are? It's in this week's Playbook Football Newsletter. Just download it now at playbooksports.com. You're tuned in to Mark Lawrence Against the Spread, the nation's most popular sports handicapping talk show. And with that, let's move on to our next segment here and get right into the National Football League Week 1 card. And I'm going to go around the around the horn here, and I want to ask anybody here, which one game on this card do you feel will tell us more about any team this season? Sometimes you'll find performances in game one that set the table or ruin the table, one or the other. But, uh, Andy, let me ask you this. Which one game on the card this week is going to tell us more about a team than any game they play this year? Well, I, it might very well be the Friday night game between Green Bay and and Philadelphia. First of all, it's being played at a neutral site, so there's not only home, no home field advantage, there's no home country advantage in that <laughs> game. Uh, so that sort of even things out. And it, it, it presents two interesting questions that need to be answered. Was Philadelphia's collapse last year the sign of something that uh, may indicate a decline in the program, much like we saw Tennessee decline a few years ago when they had a horrible end of the season after having the AFC number one seed uh, in uh, the midpoint of the season. And for Green Bay, you know, Jim talked about Green Bay as far as on the uncertainty about Jordan Love. Now, they, I think, including the playoffs last year, were uh, what, 10 and 9, I think it was. They made the playoffs at 9 and 8. The year before, I think they were 9 and 8 overall. They missed the playoffs on the last day of the season. But that was really the outlier season because they were 12, 13 win teams the two years before that. Now, that obviously was with Aaron Rodgers while Jordan Love was backing up and studying and learning the game. So we'll learn a little bit more about how much was the second half of Green Bay season last year a sign of perhaps things being in the same trajectory for the Packers, almost like the trajectory has been for Detroit, or not not coming from the same depths of despair that uh, the Lions had come from a few years earlier. So uh, I, I, I repeat this probably, I probably say three, four times a year. When two good teams meet, one good team has to lose. And when two bad teams meet, one bad team has to win. With the situation with the two good teams meeting, I don't necessarily downgrade the good team that loses as long as they are reasonably competitive in that game. And I don't necessarily mean the final score, but just throughout the game, did they ever let it get out of hand? Or was it always perhaps a never more than a two-score game with the team that's trailing making it a one-score game, maybe a time or two during it? So if we see a very competitive game for uh, the Eagles and the Packers with not a lot of turnovers or penalties or miscues, I would say that both sides are positive. And again, depending upon who wins or who loses, I may or may not have an adjustment on, on either team. Hopefully I'm looking for a competitive game. In fact, one of the things I'm playing this week, uh, because we talk about the Thursday night game as well, I'm doing a two-team teaser with the underdog Ravens, with the underdog Packers. Well, Andy, you mentioned uh, Green Bay and Philadelphia. They're in Sao Paulo, Brazil, playing this week. And uh, a good friend of mine, Howard Eskin from Philadelphia, he's the sideline reporter for the Eagles. 
he said he received an edict from the National Football League that the players and all the personnel that are going to this game cannot leave the hotel grounds. You cannot wear any flashy jewelry or carry your cell phones anywhere outside of the building. I guess crime is rampant there right now. And um, so my answer to that might be the team that comes back with the most jewelry intact will be the team that will fare the better. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder, we- by the way, if that will affect any of the routines of the players who are asked to be doing something that or I guess you'd have to say they've never been asked to do here in the U.S. Darius Slay went on uh, went on Twitter and apologized for saying that he was a little apprehensive about going, and uh, the comments that he's getting is well, he apologized, right? So, well, nobody's going to be able to see your apology because <laughs> Twitter's banned in Brazil. Now. So <laughs> that is that is hilarious. But yeah, uh, well, Tony, uh, Tony, I, while I've got you there, what would your answer be to this question here? What team do you think will show us more gonna- this week? That we're going to hear so much. I, I have an answer for you right now. I'm on, on, on the on the previous thing, right now it's a no, um, and I'll, I'll go into that. But as far as who are we going to be able to tell something about right now, week one, my answer is the New Orleans Saints, because they're home playing the Carolina Panthers, a team that won, you know, only twice last year. They got shut out the last two games of the season and scored only one first quarter touchdown over their last eight games. So this is a bad team that's supposed to be better. Uh, but New Orleans and Dennis Allen's make or break year in week one when you have a really, really tough schedule coming up. Uh, you know, Derek Carr did play some in this preseason. Alvin Kamara in a, in a contract dispute did not. I want to see whether they coalesce and do what they're supposed to do. Last time they played uh, Carolina and New Orleans, they blew them out as they should. So if, you, if, if we get into the fourth quarter, and uh and this will tell you how i'm viewing this game and i'm being messed around with on this laying this four points i'm gonna be pretty upset dennis allen so we'll uh we'll see i I do expect uh carolina to be improved i think new orleans if they're a legitimate football team and they've certainly got the talent to do so um should beat them by 10 points and if they don't serious problems what's interesting about that game with carolina is we may learn a little bit this year was it bryce young or frank reich last year that uh, caused a lot of the, the the awful offensive play, both beginning and off, of course, after he was removed uh, during the season. Because, uh, you know, if Bryce Young, and he does have some physical concerns, but if he was the number one draft choice last year, uh, and it was not a shock, th- th- uh, more than a handful of scouts had to see something that they liked in him. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's Bryce Young. I mean, I, that if you talk to people around that, that uh, team and then around the NFL that, that would know, that offensive line was horrific. Uh, so, and, and I mean, you watch games, he barely had time to throw. So we'll see. And just, just to put a little bow on what we asked, about, or what you asked Andy about the NFC, uh, about NFC and AFC championship uh, featuring both division rivals. So far, no, since realignment, uh, a, a conference championships only occurred three times, Steelers, Ravens in 08, Packers, Bears in 10, 49ers, Seahawks in 13. And I got to pre, pre-realignment we had the Jaguars and Titans play in 2000, but the other conference did not. I think it was uh, one of the Cowboys and 49ers meetings. So I'll continue to work on that. Can I add one to that, Tony, sure. real quick? Uh, sure. I just checked the database as well, and it looks like there may have been a situation as recently as two years ago in which this occurred. Two teams, 49ers Rams? Right. Uh, 49ers Rams. Rams won 20 to 17 in the right. 2022 playoffs. And then prior to that, I do get that Seattle beating San Francisco 23-17 to in, in the 2014 playoffs. Uh, that's just in the last uh, 10 years. So yeah. it sounds like there's only been three total occurrences, right? Yeah, I, I was looking yeah. at there'd be divisional rematches in both conferences. Exactly. So, 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 far, so far, no on that. Right, so none. No yep. Yeah. yep. Oh, by the way, the uh, Giants did beat. Washington. That was back in 1986. That was the first Super Bowl win for the Giants uh, with Bill Parcells and Phil Simms beating uh, the Washington Redskins back in 1986. So, and that, that would have been Browns and, and Broncos and probably the, the Ernest Biner game. So, Those were not division rivals. Those were not that division rivals. The, the, that might have been the game because I remember the uh, Giants and Broncos in the Super Bowl. Tony, you wanted to know who was the biggest – culprit in the Carolina Panthers demise last year, Frank Reich or Bryce Young. 
And uh, in our playbook newsletter, in the write-up of the game, I remember this because I wrote it. I just have to read my glasses to read it. Uh, what I wrote, but you look at Bryce Young last year, uh, what he didn't do in the National Football League, he was last in completion percentage, last in yards per game, last in touchdowns, and last in quarterback rating. That was all from the guy who was the number one pick of the National Football League draft, which will probably go down as one of the biggest busts as the first number one first all-time pick in the National Football League draft, other than maybe LaMarcus Russell and uh, – Andy, correct me if I'm wrong. Was I know Russell was a first round pick? Was he the first pick of the draft for the Raiders? Do you remember? I, I don't recall. I remember one of the first. Yeah, he was the first winner too. Yeah, I'm trying first to first overall pick of the draft. He was. You're giving well, up on, on Bryce Young already? Well, I'm just saying, last, 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 last. Uh, you you got to add to that resume somehow. <laughs> yeah, better happen this year. He had, he had, I have problems he, with he, Bryce Young. You did hit Adam Thielen you enough. His, you look at his physicality. He's a small guy. They bring in the first round, and this is what I understand. You bring in a first-round draft choice into a bad team with a bad offensive line, and he happens to be really small and kind of frail. So what are you thinking? I mean, you got to have people around you to be good. He's not going to be good right. by himself, and I don't, I don't think they've done a good job there. I think they're and, very overrated, and I think they're being very overhyped right and now. And that's why you see a lot of teams before they they know they're going to need a new quarterback two, three years down the road. They begin two, three years down the road building a, a competent, outstanding line to protect them. Well, right. That could well have been the owner meddling in that draft pick, the selection yeah. uh, David <laughs> Tepper. Own, <laughs> owners don't do that. You don't think so, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Victor, what's your answer here? What uh, game do you think will tell us the most about any team in the National Football League as far as their season goes this year on this week's card? Absolutely. Well, guys, since you're on the topic of the number one overall draft pick, for me, it's the Titans-Bears game in week one. And at Chicago, is there, if they're going to make any sort of, you know, big leap to playoff contender, then they're going to have to take care of business, particularly when they are tabbed as – home favorites like this game uh four and a half to five point favorites against tennessee a convincing win over the titans would definitely put them in the right direction but an upset loss would uh, put them in a big time early hole especially knowing that they have back-to-back non-conference road games on deck in week two and week three and one more note about rookie quarterbacks making their first start I got a little bit here. Um, rookie quarterbacks starting week one on the road have gone 8 and 19 straight up. They've gone 12, 13, and 2 against the spread. That's pretty much split right down the middle. There are two rookie quarterbacks starting on the road this week. I believe Denver on the road against Seattle. Nixon and Daniel. I'm sorry, who else? Jaden Daniels for Washington. Oh, and Washington on the road against Tampa. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, one more thing. The first overall pick of the draft, if he was a quarterback, these teams have actually gone 5 and 12 ATS. It doesn't matter if they're home or away. That's what um, Caleb Williams will be going against in week one as that four and a half to five point favorite against Tennessee. The number one overall pick has indeed struggled uh, in their first game. Also, we note that those teams. They've only averaged 18.8 points per game. Pretty important if you're determining if you're going to be going over the total or under in the total in those games. Rookie quarterbacks only average 18.8 points per game, dating all the way back to the merger in their first game of the season. Which is interesting because I'm actually giving some consideration to using Chicago as a survivor pick this week. Uh, knowing full well about the record about rookie quarterbacks, they are at home. They are going up against the Tennessee team that clearly, based upon some of the moves they've made over the last couple of years, is a team in transition, a rebuilding team. And the other thing is, and my thoughts, I, I'm not going to repeat them here, but my thoughts about the Bears and their approach to the draft are well known. The fact is, they've surrounded Caleb Williams with a lot of skilled position and a defense, uh, position players, and a defense that showed significant improvement last year so it's a little bit of a dilemma that i've got about 72 hours to work on well i'll throw this in here my my pick for uh, this week of what one game will tell us the most about any team also matches victors uh and it happens to be the chicago bear tennessee titans game out for a lot of the reasons victor mentioned uh if they don't win this football game uh you know for 
close the cellar door. This football team is going to be ragged on all football season long. If they win it, you know, maybe they're out of the hole and they're advancing and they're moving forward. I'm a little bit concerned about whether they're going to win this game, however, or not. You know, Tennessee's in a rebuild mode. We all know that. New young head coach. His father comes along to be his offensive lineman from Cleveland, uh, Bill Callahan, who, by the way, just won the Dr. Paul Zimmerman Award uh, just this week by the National Football League uh, for an offensive lineman. And uh, uh, I do know this about Tennessee. If you look at their wide receivers, they match up with just about any team in the National Football League. And you bring Bill Callahan to manage and grow and develop this offensive line. They give Will Levis some time to throw the football. We could also see a different Tennessee Titan out uh, situation this particular year as well. Jim Feist, how do you see what pivotal game for any team in the National Football League counts the most? I'm just going to add something to that Tennessee analysis. Will uh-huh. Levis, uh, who has great-looking girlfriends, by the way, um, he is one of the favorites to have the most passing yards this year. Now, that really? is that is interesting for a rebuilding team that he was marginal last year. He obviously has a big arm. Uh, he can get the ball down the field. and But like you said, Mark, he has some great wide receivers. Yes, he does. Now, you know, I like going against what the journalists in the country all want to hype. And the hyping Caleb Williams. There aren't too many journalists that I know that have actually made a living betting sports. So you fade them, you're probably on the right side. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean... Caleb is, is Williams has tremendous talent. Everybody recognizes that draft. They drafted him and he's got, he probably got a great future as long as, you know, he can stay healthy and I hope he does, but this is a lot to ask. I mean, it's a different game. You got to be mature. They question his maturity when he was in college because he wasn't totally focused in into it, but talent wise, he's there, but there's a lot of talent that goes wasted if you don't have the right mentality it's gonna now the question is when he starts to lose he starts to get hit how's he gonna handle the pressure from the press from the people that all loved him and now he's under the gun he's got to produce that's a lot for a young kid um yeah i'm gonna learn a lot from that game i'm not picking on that particular game i think picking on going against teams and looking what you're going to learn I don't think very many teams are really ready to play the football season because they really don't practice the properly. They don't get enough reps. They don't play and practice in pads. So there's not a lot of people out there, a lot of teams out there ready to go. And and that definitely that doubles up for young kids. So I'm, I'm looking – like you take a team like Houston. They're on the road against a division rival, and they're a favorite. That's a tough spot in anybody's business to go against a division rival and be a favorite on the road. You're going to learn a lot about Houston. They were surprised last year. Tremendous coaching job. Tremendous additions during the offseason. Tremendous quarterback play last year. And the way they ripped apart the Browns in the playoffs, that was very impressive. So I'm, I'm, there's a lot of things to learn and a lot of things I look for. My bets are about 20% of what they normally would be after get get week three and four. So that I bet a lot less early because I'm you know I'm looking to learn. I'm really not looking to teach. Jim, related to your comment about Levis and uh, leading the league in passing yards, would that also equate to perhaps on playing the Titans? under the total because the expectation is generally in a situation like that if you're going to lead the league in passing yards more often than not you're playing from behind mm-hmm. i would ask calvin Rid- ridley if he's uh, betting on Will Levis. what's that no you guys didn't like that one i said i would like calvin ridley i would ask him if he's betting on will levis to <laughs> the, the, the <laughs> right you better hope he is yeah <laughs> he would know well uh, answer your question there is an instance where uh two, both division uh both conference championship games feature division of uh, participants it was 1982 so 42 years ago the dolphins over the jets as a six seed jets and uh, Washington over Dallas, and then Washington won Super Bowl 17. Doug Williams Super Bowl. Obviously. That was a- the 82 season. That was the year after the strike when I think Joe Gibbs took over in 81. I think they won like their last seven or eight games in that strike-shortened season. 
when they played it, I, I don't think it was maybe 13 games or something. And that was a sign of what was going to come the following year because I remember liking Washington a lot based upon what Gibbs did at the end of that first, that 81 season. Not having Derek Henry in that backfield for Tennessee also probably projects a little more passing yards for Will Levis as well, I would imagine. I can only imagine that. Greg De Palma, what's your answer to this question? We are all wondering which game is most pivotal to which team on this first week of the National Football League card? Uh, for me, it's actually uh, pretty easy uh, because I, I don't, I'm not picking them to make the playoffs. And we had this discussion on our, our lads NFL season preview and both of you guys uh, really liked this team and I didn't even have them in the playoffs and that's the Eagles. Uh, and uh, the reason I didn't have him in was because I just I don't trust Nick Sirianni's relationship with this team. I just don't. And if they get off to an 0 one start, uh, that could be the worst thing that could happen to that team and that locker room. So now it's only one game. But, you know, to answer your question the way that it is, you know, we are obviously over exaggerating here um, that I think that's one team that I'd, I'd be willing to over exaggerate on for just one loss. The question I have to ask you, Greg, here is this, and this is a very serious question. They're playing that game in Brazil, and all the players are taking their wives and their girlfriends. The question is, what's the over-under on the amount of Brazilian bikini waxes that these girls are going to get in Brazil? <laughs> when in Rome. <laughs> when in Mark, Rome, exactly. you, talk, you talk a lot about travel in your analysis over the years, and that's a tough trip to Brazil. That's not... I mean, there's a lot of hours in the plane. You're taking family. There's a lot of planning. I don't, you know, the, what's the focus? I mean, how much do you really learn when something's so far out of the box? And then they're telling you, you got to stay in. Okay, these people are all going to Brazil, but you can't leave your room. Okay. Right. But what are you going to do with the family, the wives, and the kids when you can't leave your room? Yep. Yeah, I mean, the, both teams have got to be there by now, though, right? Oh yeah, they're there. Yeah, but there there's rioting in the streets there because they're so up, upset with the government. I saw pictures of it yesterday. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Now it is a neutral site game, too, guys, and I may as well whip this out at you. Last year, uh, in the 2023 season, there were five neutral site games in the NFL. All five of them ended up going under the total. The games over there in England, the games Germany. over there in Germany. And wasn't there another one in Mexico City as well? Uh, I'm so. not sure on that. But all five neutral site games did go under only 33.2 points per game. Over the last seven years, neutral site regular season games, 9 and 19 over under, including 75%, 4 and 16 over under when the OU line is 43 or more points. This one is up in the 48 to 49 point range. So, again, all I'm saying is that the neutral site games do trend under, and that's over the course of since when they began, and it carries right over to what happened last season. Guys, i got to run one more question by you guys. we got to step on a little bit because we want to get to some college football here as well uh, on this show. We're going to have a good, long, lengthy show here. One other question on the National Football League card. One quick answer. What underdog that wins the game this week will not surprise you? Andy Esco. Oh, uh, you get some good reasons for uh, Tennessee. Um, I'm going to go with Carolina. I mean, they're going up against a uh, questionable, and uh, Tony talked about the coaching of uh, Dennis Allen there. Uh, I would not be shocked if Carolina, with a new start, Bryce Young having a lot to prove, uh, changes have been made to help him. Um, I wouldn't be surprised by that one. And one more that I'll throw in because it does involve a rookie quarterback. I would not be surprised, especially given the experience of their new head coach, if Washington doesn't pull an upset in Tampa Bay. I agree with you. Victor King, what one underdog would not surprise you? I like that. Uh, Mark might agree with me on this one, but uh, we got a week one game that uh, a team's got the motivation of playoff revenge in week one, and that's the L.A. Rams. And I would not be surprised if the Rams beat Detroit easily this week. They lost 24-23 to in the wild card round last January. Did the Rams on the road against Detroit. They were plus three. Over under line was 53 and a half. They outstatted the Lions in that game. They outgained them by about 90 yards in the game. 435 to 356. 
The Rams scored only 17 points in the first half. They were stymied in the red zone in the second half, scoring only two field goals. So uh, one more thing that I found in the database, NFC Conference Week 1 Road Dogs of less than a touchdown playing with revenge like the Rams. Not only have they gone 6-1 and one ATS in the last four years, but they've gone 6-1 and one straight up to boot. Rams always a very good team playing with revenge. So, again, I would not be surprised. And, in fact, to wrap it up, Tuco has got the Rams – to score <laughs> over 23 and a half points against the go. Lions as well. There you go. Yeah, all over I, the By the way, <laughs> by the way, there is a revenge game Thursday night with Baltimore and Kansas City, and I think Baltimore would has a, would not be surprising if they have an upset, especially if John Harbaugh re- realizes you are allowed to call running plays in the second half. <laughs> <laughs> you got that. Not to mention the Ravens are a fantastic underdog too. Well, and that's my answer to this question, guys, because you hit on it, Andy. My answer would be Baltimore Ravens, John Harbaugh. One of the best coaches in the NFL in revenge. And that's obviously another playoff revenge game for him there that way as well. How much, how much, how much do you think Henry is going to help the Ravens this year? Well, I think he's going to help them tremendously, provided he still has still has wheels. Uh, you know, he's beginning. You know, he was beginning to go backwards. So it depends on how motivated he is. But I think he's, he's thirty this year, thirty years. Right. Old. He's going to take away a lot of those potential injury situations in which Lamar Jackson takes off and runs with the ball. So he's going to keep his quarterback healthier, uh, Derrick Henry, yeah. Yeah. Uh, absorbing some of those uh, pounded ground uh, yardage plays that Lamar used to do in the past. By the way, the other interesting aspect, talk about the intangible situations. Of course, you've got the revenge for Baltimore, but you've also got Kansas City, who remembers losing at home on the Thursday night game last year to Detroit. That was the opening game, correct? Oh, right, yes, yes it was. Season. Tony Mejia, who do you see as the underdog that would not surprise you that wins the game? Would not surprise me if the Jaguars go down uh, to your backyard and beat the Dolphins. Uh, I think you guys know Miami very fickle as far as a home field advantage. Jacksonville, I'm sure they'll have some fans there. It's a three, three, four hour ride uh, for Jaguars faithful. And I, this is a matchup between two new defensive coordinators, Anthony Weaver taking the Dolphins out for a spin for the first time. And you've got Nielsen, uh, he's been a coordinator for two teams now, the past two seasons. Uh, New Orleans and Atlanta, and now he's uh, with the Jaguars. Jaguars are much better offensively in terms of talent. Uh, getting Gabe Davis in there, the number one, drafting Brian Thomas Jr., so I think Trevor Lawrence has no excuses now. He, he seems to have a nice connection with Evan Ingram. I think, uh, uh, you know, the totals are your game, Victor, but I, I, I kind of dive into them as well, and I, I see this game as a shootout. Uh, I think both teams will, will be able to, to score the football, and it would not surprise me if late field goal from Jacksonville pulls out the outright upset. Jim Feist, who is that dog that you think wins the game on a money line this week? Well, I think it's going to be a dog week. I think I think, think there'll be quite a bit. I think you're going to have to test out the Atlanta Falcons. A lot of people are hyping up Atlanta as, I mean, this is the next coming, you know, and now you're going to play the Pittsburgh Steelers. I mean, this team doesn't lose often. They don't, they On paper, they don't look all that good, but somehow you know, Tomlin gets them out on the field. They, get, they win more games than they lose. That's not a big surprise. I wouldn't be surprised if Caleb Williams uh, drops a game. Uh, you know, this is this is the kind of thing where you're, you're dealing with teams that are favored like that in, in, in situations where they're not used to being favored, and they generally don't do that well when they're in those kind of spots. So I think there's going to be a lot of potential upsets and a lot of unders. Now, the one mentioned about the, the over, I li- you know originally I liked the over in that J- Jags um, or Jacksonville and um, and uh, Miami Houston. game. However, I looked at the weather, and in Florida, and you guys are living down there, so you're going to know this. And the, you know the intermittent rain and the thunderstorms that could hit anything in Florida. And there are some predictions of uh, showers in that Miami game. Yeah, the, well, I, I actually looked at this this morning because this, this was one of my sporting news write-ups in Jacksonville. It's going to rain pretty significantly, and I'm I'm towards the northern part of Florida, so I will probably watching be watching uh, Sunday games in the rain. In South Florida, it looks like it's going to be sunny, so it feels like 100 degrees, and there'll probably be a, a thunderstorm for about five minutes to cool things off, which is the norm down there. Yeah, the Get weather forecast down here all the time is intermittent rain in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Greg De Palma, who do you see? Who's the who's the shocker, the underdog that doesn't surprise you this week? Green Bay. So Green Bay. yeah, it shouldn't be a surprise <laughs> since I have the Packers in the championship game. I don't have the Eagles in the playoffs, and uh, yeah, uh, and 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 I do think that this is uh, this is the way that if the Eagles are going to have one of those long seasons, then I think it starts on Friday night. Hey, guys, before we move it over to the college football side of things, a quick note here that the Playbook Totals tip sheet is out right now. Victor talked about it early on in the show. He's had winning seasons 14 out of 17 years that he's published this newsletter. He's terrific in the last five years, 72-38 overall. He features five NFL best bets every week. Subscribe to the Totals tip sheet today in time for the game starting tomorrow on Thursday at playbooksports.com. Jim, are you going to join us for the college football uh, show, or do you need a bug out? Well, I can I can stay. Cool. I, if there's something that pops up, I'll. Cool. I don't uh, like I said. I don't I don't originate the college anymore. I, do, I I do a lot of research and follow other people that are that are big batters that are doing well. Now we'd like to hear your opinion, nonetheless. Just the same. Okay, Greg, I'm going to turn it over to you to ask the roundtable guys here about top dogs or top trends on this week's college football card, much like you did last week. All right. So uh, what we can do is, uh, is, is basically after we've got a week one under the, under the books uh, and we actually had an opportunity now, finally to see every team play. Uh, we'll start with you, Andy. Uh, what's going to be uh, the one play? What's going to be the one game? Uh, give our, our, our viewers maybe even a tip, something out there that uh, intrigues you the most about week two in college football. Well, we didn't see every team play. I mean, Ball State was not scheduled, and the teams that I bet All right, wise really guy. Show up. <laughs> Keep going. Okay. <laughs> the team I like this week, and again, you can't tell much from the uh, uh, the games last week to the extent that you, you, you were talking about 30, 35-point favorites in many cases, but I was looking for good signs from Arkansas last week, and they played a, a patsy in uh, Arkansas Pine Bluff. They're going to Oklahoma State this year. Sam Pittman came over to Arkansas with a, a, a highly – uh, respected uh, admiration around the coaching fraternity and uh, uh, the college football uh, betters as, as well. He started off with success with the Razorbacks, but it's been lean times the last few years. I believe they're getting, I think, eight, eight and a half points right now as I look. And I'm going to look for Arkansas in what is a make or break season, I think, for the coach. I think only because he had that early success is he back this year. Now, he did lose his, lose his uh, quarterback, but I like a lot of the returning talent. I liked I like. I guess the word would be poised that they showed last week, albeit they could have just shown up and put 70 up against Arkansas Pine Bluff. And, in fact, that was one of the games that, for betting purposes, uh, you couldn't collect on because they agreed in the second half to play 10-minute halves instead of 15. So that resulted in most books as no action. But Oklahoma State is, is a respectable team. They've had a lot of good success under Mike Gundy, who's in I don't know, close to his 20th year, and he's had some very good teams there. But they don't have to lose this game to uh, – uh, I mean, they, they don't have to cover this game and still and, and not uh, win the game outright. So uh, they can win. I, th I would not be shocked if Arkansas pulls the upset, but I do expect a covering situation for them. I expect a, cover I, I expect a competitive game out of the Razorbacks. Is that more of your belief in Arkansas or you're not so into Oklahoma State? I'm somewhat indifferent about Oklahoma State. It's a very interesting uh, Big 12 conference this year, especially with the changes that have occurred over the past couple of seasons in the uh, makeup of the conference. Uh, I, you know, it's, Big 12 is interesting because the big two teams, uh, Oklahoma and Texas, are no longer there. So it's pretty much wide open. So there's an opportunity for teams like an Oklahoma State or an Iowa State, which have been pretty good teams in recent seasons, and maybe this will be the year and they can hold off. I guess the favorite is the uh, incoming team from Utah from the uh, Pac-12. And then you got the two Kansas teams, Kansas and Kansas State, who figure to be contenders. So I'm sort of ambivalent towards Oklahoma State. I see them as maybe an eight or nine win team. It's a lot more to do with the Arkansas program, the recruiting they do. And although it didn't work for me last week with uh, Florida against Miami, uh, this is a team with an SEC pedigree that does recruit top-tier talent that are deciding between teams like Missouri and uh, Mississippi and the Alabamas and the Mississippi States and the LSUs, and many of them do choose to go to Arkansas. So I think it's a competitive game, and it's, it's more of a play on Arkansas than it is even a play against Oklahoma State. Okay, and then um, like, lastly, uh, it'll be two questions, and the second one is just going to be, you, you mentioned Florida. Do you have a particular game from last week uh, that surprised you the most, the result, whether it's a positive or a negative way? 
I would say Florida game is, is the one because that was a, a two-point game. They were a, they were at home. They were an underdog, which still indicates that on a neutral field, Miami would have been close to a touchdown favorite. But that team did not look anywhere as well-prepared, especially for a coach in Napier who's on the hot seat uh, as far as uh, – I would imagine there's probably still some talk there. And I guess the other uh, situation would be the Boston College-Florida State game. Now, I liked I liked Boston College, but I thought it was a situation. Florida State knew they were playing for their chances at the playoffs. I think I saw they had a, I don't know what it was, a, a 36 or something percent chance of making it before the season started. It's now down to 1%. So it's not so much that they didn't cover the spread. They didn't win the game, and they were right. barely competitive in yeah. the first half of that game. So I'd say uh, the two of the three big Florida schools, Florida and FSUs, were the biggest surprises to me this past weekend. And again, I think the key uh, a part of that, Mark, is the fact that when you made that prediction with Boston College, it was exactly that reason that Florida State just looked completely just not even interested, like they weren't focused, like they had a major hangover, and they needed that extra week uh, going overseas and losing a, such a close game like that. They just, uh, I, I don't blame the coach. I just i just think, first of all, I think we all agree, or at least you and I agree, that Florida State was not going to be as good as people think in the first place. Uh, but second of all, it, it was just that hangover written all over it. Absolutely hangover written all over it. And, uh, you know, you have to ask yourself the other side of the coin, Greg, what if Florida State had uh, not lost that first football game and would have come back with the win in their back pocket? Would Boston College have gone on there and caught them a little bit fat? I think either way. Boston College ended up being a good handicap to the football game either way. All right. Uh, yeah, but by the way, I passed that Boston College game for that very reason. The, uh, I think in my, in my newsletter last week when I did my money earners and burners, the two teams I had – or two of the three teams I had in the uh, ACC were Georgia Tech and – and. Um, Boston College because I, I like O'Brien at Boston College and I like the job that, uh, that's been done at uh, Georgia Tech and what I thought right now was going to be a very good ACC when you take a look at some of the teams that were upset this week or that have played poorly I may have I may, my preseason uh, assessment of the ACC may have been way overstated and fortunately there are 12 or 13 uh, uh, weeks remaining to take advantage of my incorrect assessment all right Vic <laughs> What do you like this week? Uh, one, you know, and I, I'm sure you're going to go to the totals uh, way, which is which is uh, why you're the totals guy. So talk a little bit about week two in college football. Uh, give us uh, some advice or a pick that is of, of most interest to you. Uh, I'm glad you didn't bet on that because I'm going to go to side plays rather than totals. All right, I like it. <laughs> Before that, I got a question for the panel: Who did Michigan and Ohio State pay off? to get such a favorable schedule this season. You realize that both the Buckeyes and Michigan have eight home games this year and only four true road games. If they pay eight off anybody. In balance. And not only off. that, guys, but there's actually six teams in college football this season that have eight home games and four road games, twice as many home games from the Big Ten, Ohio State, Michigan and Indiana, and in the SEC, Auburn, Texas A&M, and Kentucky. Can somebody answer that question? If how the yes. team's got a terrible schedule, go ahead. If if they paid off anybody, it would have been the Big Ten commissioner for approving the schedule because Ohio State and Michigan give the and maybe to a certain extent Penn State give the Big Ten a chance to a make the playoffs and have a legitimate shot, especially Ohio State, of winning the national title. And that's all about the revenue that they would get from advancing that far. Yeah, keep in mind, uh, just take is that is that considered a conspiracy theory? <laughs> Could. <laughs> By some. The question was, yes. <laughs> Twice as many home games. Wow. Keep, and we got to go back far in our database to find uh, schedules like that, Mark. That's for sure. I, I think yeah, Ohio State plays the softest the schedule that... of anybody this year. It, it, yeah. My goodness, number two ranked team in the country, and if they lose a game, it, it'll be a headline. You know. Yeah. The, yes. the only thing that prevents that from really being a conspiracy to a certain extent is the inclusion of Indiana in that group instead of yes. Penn State or Wisconsin, maybe. Yeah. Right. Now, back to um, the, Greg's question. Uh, what I'm looking for in college football are teams that kind of crapped the bed last week on offense last week. Teams who scored seven or less points in their first game of the season. And this is out of the database now. It's gone 21-5 and five ATS last eight years. In the last four years alone, 12-1 and one against the spread. 
Game two college football road teams who scored seven or less points the previous week. Uh, in conference play, the teams have gone a perfect 7-0, and ATS as well. There are four of them going this week. It might require Mark to get out his clothespin, that is for <laughs> sure, because those four teams are on the road, big underdogs, scored seven or less last week. Temple plus the double digits <laughs> on the road against Navy. Uh, Charlotte plus the 22 against North Carolina. Akron plus the three touchdowns or more against Rutgers. And finally, Houston plus the 29 or more against Oklahoma. Again, it might require the clothespin, but those four teams will be playing a situation that's gone 25 and 5 ATS, 12 and 1 in the last four years. I had, I had the clothespin on. I had the close pin on my nose last night watching Houston last week. <laughs> All right. uh, go right ahead then, Vic, if you have a game uh, from last week that's stuck in your craw or uh, just in general, maybe uh, uh, a team uh, impressed you more than you thought. Either way. Well, uh, no, a team that shocked me was uh, not only did they not cover the point spread, but Virginia Tech losing on the road yeah, against, was... against SEC doormat Vanderbilt, favored by 14 points. Not only did they not cover, they didn't even win the game. It went into overtime. Good for the Commodores to get that nice home win, but we thought Virginia Tech was a lot better than that. Uh, by the way, that broke Vanderbilt's 61 consecutive <laughs> uh, losing streak when they trailed by seven or more in the fourth quarter. There you go. 61 trade. But, hey, you know what it is? He's not the head coach, but Jerry Kill is part (laughs) of that Vanderbilt team, as is his quarterback from New Mexico State last year, Diego Pavia. So you have to think that that's the the thing that's great about the transfer portal. That right there is to be able to get quarterbacks like Diego Pavia to go to Vanderbilt. Yep. So uh, let's uh, go to you, Tony. So first, uh, what do you have for this week? All right, so what do you what do you want specifically? You want whatever you want. Talk about a, huh? Whatever you want to do. You got a pick of the week. You got a trend bunch of, the of games week. that, that I'll, I'll just say a bunch of games that are intriguing. Starting with Texas, Michigan. Michigan did not look great uh, against Fresno State. That game probably a lot closer than if you just looked at the score. You didn't realize how well and and tightly the Bulldogs played uh, Michigan. So definitely looking to see if Texas can be as impressive. Uh, as they were because, uh, you know, they really did wipe the floor with Colorado State. I expected to see a little more out of the Rams, and uh, the Longhorns looked awfully impressive. Well, let's start with that. Defense. Let's start with that. So, uh, you know, everybody can jump in. Um, I mean, guys, I mean, obviously Michigan's defense looks uh, uh, really strong, but their quarterback, everybody thought they were going to that athlete. They didn't. They went with a walk-on, and they're just going to try to play, I think, the kind of uh, uh, football that they did when Brian Greasy was the quarterback, and they, and they won games 13-3 to all season. It's not going to work because uh, 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 this Warren kid is not Brian Greasy, and they don't have Charles Woodson, even though they have somebody pretty close, uh, and he had a pick six in the game. Uh, but, yeah, what, what do you guys think? Because Michigan's a seven-point dog. Did, did you guys think that the spread was going to be seven? Well, that, that's what I wanted to ask Mark. When was the last time Michigan – was a touchdown underdog at home, especially against a non-big team rival, because or not big to the opponent, because they may have been in the lean years against Ohio State. Yeah, it would be some of the leaner years because Michigan hasn't really truly been a power. I mean, they've been a power, you know, going back to Bo Schembechler and moving forward, but they've had a couple of lean years in between there as well. Uh, but this is a healthy number, plus seven and a half. Uh, in our newsletter this week, we, we usually put an incredible stat of the week in the newsletter here, and I'm going to share with everybody that uh, if you take a look, defending national champions like Michigan are, they're 118 and 12 outright at home when they're coming off a home game. Wow. 118 and 12 outright at home off a home game. That's a pretty strong number to give a team seven and a half points. Uh, and Texas right now, they're feeling awfully good about themselves. If you ask me the question, Victor, that'll be the game that I would answer to you about the football game that I'd be going to this week. Tony, did you did you think that the line was going to be seven? That's I mean that's precisely why I make my own lines before I start, and now it has to be done on Sunday nights because I start previewing these games for the gold sheet of uh, Sunday night. So I have to make sure before I see the number, I write down my own number. My own number was three and a half. Yeah, 
with that's where I had. Right, yeah. yeah. So you know, from that standpoint, it, 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 look, it makes it it makes you make a determination. Like, is this an overreaction to Texas? Do I believe this? Do I believe that you know the books are just wrong? Do I believe that the books are extremely right and uh, and Texas is significantly favored uh, for a reason? And look, if you just watch these games, I don't tell you what Michigan did last year. Uh, I, I would buy that number. Yeah. Now, granted, it's, this is going to be Michigan at, at, at the big house. We've seen uh, Michigan last year when they had a, a, a top 10 pick as, as your quarterback have games where they exclusively run the ball. Uh, maybe Penn State that way, right? So it, 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 in this instance, I don't think that they're good enough to beat Texas without uh, some hits in the passing game. So I give me two words here. Also, Tony, in this game, and Greg, you you can relate to this exactly. Wink Martindale. Yeah, the not the game show host. Not right. the game Very show. Good defensive coordinator. The new defensive coordinator for Michigan, who uh, has done a tremendous job at football programs that he's gone to and turned teams around. And uh, I think he's just what this team needs to be able to thwart and shut down a Texas Longhorn team on the road. By the way, there's a situation coming up that where you play next week. Michigan hosts. A really bad Arkansas State team next week, but the week after that, they play USC. So they're sandwiched next week against Arkansas State between Texas and USC. So you may this will be a close pin game, but you may want to take a look at Arkansas State when that first line comes out. Tony, what other games? Uh, Cal Auburn intrigues me just because uh, Cal played Auburn so well last year, and it's an immediate rematch. Uh, you know. Q Freeze does have a better grasp on the Tigers now, but still Peyton Thorne is a quarterback, and Justin Wilcox is a defensive guy, but he's got to go cross country. But now he better get used to going cross country because they've got, I believe, four or five games on the East Coast as members of the ACC. So that'll be interesting. Uh, Cal can compete in that game. I made that number 15 and a half. It's about 14 and a half. Probably you'll stay away, although I do a video on it. Um, we also got uh, games of in the same situation where teams did not look good last week, and now I look at the number, and I don't necessarily agree with it. Clemson playing Appalachian State. Um, number is exa exactly what I thought it would be, but uh, do I like Appalachian State? And then we also have um, the, the a really good matchup between Oregon and Boise State, uh, where the Ducks, I watched that game, and I had the Ducks first half, Ducks full game against Idaho, and man, Oregon has some issues on the offensive line, and they won't necessarily be fixed overnight because what I read was that uh, the Ducks had guys out that needed to be reshuffled uh, their offensive line, and that was no fluke. Idaho just basically played with them the way that Georgia Tech. Tony, didn't them. Oregon uh, – weren't they up like only three points or so in the fourth quarter of that football game? 14 14 correct. And so, I mean, it, 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 if, boy, uh, for, for, if anybody hasn't seen Ashton Gentry – yeah, six touchdowns is a lot, but that's no fluke. I mean, he is a legitimate top two-round NFL running back. Um, so we will see if they can get the quarterback play to play with Oregon. That's very interesting to me. Then we've got Tennessee against your Wolfpack, Greg. And I think, uh, obviously, uh, NC State was disappointing in, in, in game one. But they have playmakers, and obviously Tennessee does. Uh, I am Ali is uh, my dark horse Heisman guy. That's going to be a hell of a game at, at Charlotte. So... A lot of fun games this week uh, to, to look at, uh, and then my, am I, am I, do I give out my top play? Mm, for, I'll, I'll just hold on to that because I'll hold on to it as a client play. But there is a big blog that I really like, and if uh, if you guys see it on my, uh, that's my play in college on this contest. That by, I'm the, by the by. way, Tony, uh, did Oregon just look flat, disinterested, or they took Idaho for granted, or were they really having some skilled players out there trying to do things that you could tell they, they were got beat up in? up front, Andy? That was it. Dylan Gabriel played fine. Their 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 attack was fine. Idaho played about as well a defensive game because they they hung with them as 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 expected. And then Idaho's no slouch, I guess, at the FCS level. But this is a, a very good Oregon team that just I I don't think that they have it up front just yet. It's probably going to be a team that you look in December and say, how the hell did that happen? Mm -hmm. um, but now you get Boise, who is not is no joke. So that's why, uh, that's why I was concerned that they might have just been saving everything for Boise. Maybe, and they, and, and maybe, more, com but, more competitive game despite the high number. The yeah, fact that the game was as competitive as it was fourth quarter and that's you a concern. kind of saw the same things. I mean, the the, 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 the breathing room touchdown from Gabriel to Johnson was on a fourth and three, I believe. 
with five minutes to go. And they went for it. They, I mean, if, if you kick a field goal, I know who has the ball down six with five minutes to go. How big of the game is it, guys, for Boise State this week in their group of five hopes to make the college football playoff this year? Uh, if, if, they, if they show up and play this game and then run through the Mountain West, that's your rep. And yes, it is. Yep. Right. Yeah. Yep. yeah, they just don't have – as long as they don't get blown out. Uh, you talk about something shape. that also surprised me. UNLV's defensive play against Houston. Nobody expected that the game to be, what was it, thirty-seven yes. nothing before Houston scored late. No, uh, final minute. Yeah, they they showed some good improvement last year on defense. The question for me coming into the season was the offense, and you know Houston's not a strong team. I did like Houston a lot last week, but uh, I did not expect uh, UNLV's defense to play the way. You know, if if Houston was going to lose the game, I thought it might have been you know thirty-eight thirty-four or something like. If they were going to win the game, or UNLV was going to lose the game, it might be high scoring. But I did not expect that great defensive effort, and I think they are now the second favorite in the Mountain West behind uh, Boise to win the conference. Yeah, they definitely knew that they had to be more disciplined. They had to get tougher, as you said, on defense because they just were outmatched by Boise State in the championship game last year. So that was the directive from Odom. He's done a good job after week one. And we have to understand, too, Willie Fritz. We all love Willie Fritz, but it's going to take him some time. And uh, I think that's uh, just a, you know one major example of that. Uh, that's why so it's good, tricky. The good, news, the good news is Barry Odom got off to a great start at his final season at UNLV. He'll be scooped up at a major program oh, yeah. after this season. Absolutely. That's All right. Yeah. Uh, oh, and by the way, keep an eye on, uh, speaking of North Carolina State, keep an eye on that kid, uh, Casey Concepcion. Because yeah, he's uh, great. you talk about, I mean, you can say what you want about, and I know uh, the Arizona receiver is just awesome too. What a, what a game he had. But Concepcion, nobody pays attention to him. And uh, he's not going to the draft because he's a true sophomore, but he's going to be a, an electric NFL player someday. Mark? Uh, last week, uh, we'll start with that. What, what was the? What, we already know about Boston College. So give me, give me another game uh, team that surprised you, positive or negative. Uh, I don't know if anything completely jumped off the map that way for me. I think uh, from a positive standpoint, uh, seeing Georgia Tech play as well as they did coming back from Ireland was really a bit of a surprise to me because. You know, we had talked about the travel factor, uh, the no rest factor there, the fact that they just apple carded Florida State, and it was really had all the make- makings of a letdown there. That surprised me that they played as well as they did. And in that same vein, I think I look for a letdown from them this week when they go to Syracuse. Uh, you know, they've put up two nice wins here so far. Now they're going to go out road chalk at Syracuse, and I think it ends for them this week. Who do you like this week? Give us, uh, give us a game. Uh, give us a, a trend. Uh, something that uh, the viewers can take advantage of. Well, you know, I, men- I mentioned the Michigan trend because of, of the defending national champions, which is, uh, you know, really, really a good case to make for them. I probably shouldn't have. I should have saved it. Is what, is what I should have done. But uh, uh, well, I, 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 I can give you one for, straight from your book. Yeah, go ahead. All right. Uh, okay. So. Um, I'm going to give you actually a, uh, I'm going to give you a conflicting one and that's Eastern Michigan at Washington. So Eastern Michigan with Chris Creighton is 33 and 11 against the spread in her last 44 situations as a road dog. They just won week one as a road dog outright at UMass and they're 10 and four uh, since 2022. But on the flip side, if you're thinking of jumping all of you Eastern Michigan, keep in mind that Jed Fish has covered nine straight when he takes on an opponent with a winning percentage of 700 or better. And Washington has covered 11 straight as a non-conference favorite of less than 28. They were 27 and a half as of yesterday. <laughs> so those are two major conflicting trends that you can only get right here in the playbook magazine. You can actually see the photo there, the image on our screen. So... And I can I can uh, contribute a lot of that to Victor Kane pulling those out of a database. <laughs> I can say that. So there you go. Uh, and 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 by the way, uh, Mark, you and I, of course, are going to dive uh, deep into college football and the NFL. We're going to go into some of these top games in college football and the NFL tomorrow. And uh, hopefully we can have just as much uh, success as we had last week in college football. Definitely we'll have those 10 point or more uh, outright money line winners. So hopefully we can uh, keep that going. And uh, we start with the NFL on tomorrow's show as well. Uh, so that is not going to be live anymore. We, we, we were originally going to do it live, but we're going to record it. But it should be available every Thursday on the R Lads uh, football YouTube channel, uh, probably uh, no later than uh, about 6 o'clock every Thursday evening. 
Do they show that on the rlads.com website as well, Greg, or do they, do they just take sometimes, it Sometimes. It yeah, all depends. Sometimes. Yeah, sometimes it'll be there. Uh, but as of right now, um, the best way to find it is just go right to the YouTube channel, subscribe, and you'll know when it's available uh, right away. And speaking of that, all our listeners out there, I would highly encourage you to hit the subscribe button for this show. Hit the like button as well. And as I said before in the past, you hit that like button, you subscribe, you'll have a copy of that Playbook Football Preview Guide magazine in your inbox as a thank you from us. Guys, that's going to put the wraps in this edition of Mark Lawrence Against the Spread. A great show this week. We covered a lot of territory, college football, pro football. For our panel of experts, Andy Isco from TheLogicalApproach.com in Las Vegas, Jim Feist, the legend himself in Las Vegas, Victor King from the Playbook Totals Tip Sheet, Tony Mejia, a Playbook expert and a contributor to the Sporting News, and, of course, as always, our producer, Greg De Palma. This is Mark Lawrence reminding you to always remember to bet with your head, not over it, and good luck as always.